Hey, this is Greg, creator of the Leptos Web Framework for Rust. Today, we're going to talk about the truth about Rust and WebAssembly performance. Now, to be clear, I'm only talking about WebAssembly performance for rendering in the browser, I'm not talking about um, things like WASM Edge runtimes and so on. I'm talking specifically about the performance of uh, compiling a Rust application to WebAssembly and using it to render a user interface in your browser. Um, but I often see in these conversations a few myths, so I thought it would be helpful to kind of walk through them and talk about the truth about uh, WebAssembly performance. Myth number one is that WebAssembly is amazing. Rust is much faster than JavaScript, so WebAssembly should be faster than JavaScript, and it will take over the world. Um, in fact, you'll use WebAssembly to render directly into the canvas. Um, we'll skip HTML, CSS, JavaScript altogether. Um, there are a number of reasons I don't think this is the right approach for us to be taking, um, but the basic truth is JavaScript can be quite fast when it's just in time compiled and optimized by you know, the V8 engine or in the browser, um, it runs pretty well. WebAssembly can run just as fast and there are certain tasks WebAssembly can do much faster, but in terms of rendering into the browser, the actual speed of WebAssembly versus JavaScript is not the main constraint. It really is the browser's ability to render something once you get to a certain point. So WebAssembly isn't gonna have some 5X improvement over JavaScript. But myth number two is that WebAssembly is too slow. You should use JavaScript instead. I see this a lot in the Rust community where people tend to be pretty performance conscious. There's this narrative, I think, that sure, 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 if you want a fast website, um, build the back end in Rust, build your APIs in Rust, um, but then use a, a fast JavaScript front end framework, like maybe Svelte gets recommended a lot, or if you're super performance conscious, clued in, maybe SolidJS. Um, and this is kind of true, except you'll see when we dig into the actual benchmarks here that um, there are plenty of Rust and WebAssembly frameworks that are faster than almost all the JavaScript frameworks. So there is no longer really a constraint on WebAssembly performance in that way. Um, WebAssembly is not too slow to use for rendering in the browser. Uh, there's a third kind of half myth, which is that WebAssembly will finally be fast enough once it's able to directly access the DOM. So you may know that right now, WebAssembly can't directly call uh, into browser APIs. It, it has to call out through JavaScript, and then JavaScript will call out to the DOM. There's a WASM bind gen that lets us do this without having to know about it, uh, but it's there in the, in the background. Uh, we can't directly do something like create a DOM element uh, or set an attribute or set the contents of a text node uh, from within WebAssembly. And so there's this perception that once we finally land one of the several proposals that will allow WebAssembly to directly access the DOM, then there will finally be good performance. And this one is partially true. It will probably help close the gap between WebAssembly and JavaScript, um, but that gap is really small right now. And the main constraint is not actually the ability to call um, DOM APIs from WebAssembly. It's actually the cost of copying strings from WebAssembly over into JavaScript, and we can talk a little bit more about why that is. So the truth about Rust and WebAssembly performance, if you want to stop watching the video right now, is that Rust and WebAssembly front-end frameworks are fast enough right now. In fact, there are several of the newer and bigger ones that are faster than almost any JavaScript framework. So this whole argument about WASM being too slow for DOM rendering simply doesn't hold water anymore. And I'm gonna spend the rest of this video basically digging into some, some benchmarks to show you exactly why I say that is. We're gonna look at the JS Framework benchmark, uh, which is a, a great benchmark just for pure rendering speed. And we're actually gonna look uh, through the Rust code of the implementation of those in a few Rust frameworks to understand what's going on in each framework, why they are different from one another. Um, so let's jump in. I'm gonna spend a lot of this video in this, um, in this JS Framework benchmark result table. If you don't know this, this benchmark, um, it basically is a measure of raw rendering speed. Um, so I'll show you what it actually is. Um, it does things like create a thousand rows, um, clear a thousand rows, uh, update the contents of every 10th row by adding some exclamation points, uh, deleting rows, right? Um, selecting rows and highlighting them, which is harder than you would think to do quickly. Um, and then my favorite one is swapping rows. So if you pay attention to the second row here, it's being swapped with the second to last row. So it's basically a stress test for different frameworks. And there are a huge number of frameworks that have implemented this benchmark. Uh, I can't even fit them all on one screen, right? Um, we're just gonna look at some of the most popular JavaScript frameworks and some of the most popular Rust frameworks to try to understand some of the differences. Um, but here's the top line, right? If you look at this results page, 
you can see that the narrative that JavaScript is faster than WebAssembly for rendering in the front end is simply not true, right? So we start out um, vanilla JS. This is just a plain vanilla JavaScript reference implementation. Um, WASM BindGen is the plain vanilla Rust and WebAssembly reference implementation. Sledgehammer is a new, very low-level library, which we'll talk about when we talk about Dioxys. Um, but this is JS, Rust, Rust, right? You'll notice um, the scores here are the sort of total score. That's 1.02 for vanilla JS, 1.04 for Sledgehammer, 1.06 for WASM BindGen. So, you know, Rust can be maybe 2% slower. It's typically about 4% slower, right, than the JavaScript equivalent. But then if you just look at the order of the rest of the, 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 bent, the frameworks we've got here, and there are a bunch of additional very fast JavaScript frameworks that are very small that people have basically never heard of. Um, but, you know, the fastest of the kind of big ones is Solid. And then we've got Leptos and Dioxys tied to Rust frameworks. Then we've got Vue, another big JavaScript framework. We've got Sycamore, another Rust framework. Svelte, another JavaScript framework. U, another Rust framework. And U is pretty much tied with React, of course, a huge JavaScript framework. Um, and I think I actually want to have React Hooks 18 up there instead of vanilla React 17. And here we go. So we've got React Hooks slightly faster than U, whatever, right? But you can see basically there's this order from um, React, U, these sort of big classic virtual DOM based libraries are typically the slowest. Um, some of the things that you would think of as being a fast JavaScript framework like Svelte is actually tied with something that's quite a fast um, Rust framework like Sycamore. And then these really performance conscious um, frameworks in Rust like Leptos and Dioxys, quite fast and really just a few percentage points slower than solid. But importantly, note that um, you know, Leptos and Dioxys are faster than Vue. Sycamore is faster than Svelte. U is uh, basically equivalent to React, right? So it's more about the approach that these libraries take than the language that you're writing in. Um, but so what makes for these differences just between the Rust WebAssembly frameworks? Um, we'll dig into the code a little bit, but let me just um, untick all our JavaScript frameworks here so we can really look at it. And I'll take out Sledgehammer 2 for a second. We'll leave in the vanilla one for reference. Okay. So there's some pretty big differences here between these different Rust frameworks. Um, if I zoom in a little bit, um, you'll notice that um, in terms of creation speed, right, how quickly you can create a thousand rows, there's a pretty widespread. Um, Wasm BindGen comes pretty close to vanilla JavaScript, right? Leptos is a, is a few points behind that, but Dioxys is, is really fast. Dioxys in creating rows is pretty close to vanilla JavaScript. Um, in fact, if we add in Sledgehammer here again, which is the library Dioxys is using under the hood, Sledgehammer is nearly identical to vanilla JavaScript in creating rows. This is really, really good. Um, in terms of things like the, the partial update, um, you'll see that, uh, which is that adding the exclamation points to the rows, um, you'll see some differences. This is an unusually good real result for Dioxys in this run, I'm, I'm curious. Um, but you know, you'll see basically uh, there's not that huge of a difference until you get to U, um, which is again doing that virtual DOM based diffing. Um, in terms of selecting a row, uh, again, Leptos is pretty close here. Uh, the others are kind of bunched, right? A little slower. Um, it's interesting to me when we get to swapping rows, right? So if you check out, um, we'll add solid back in, which is quite fast. If you notice here, in terms of swapping two rows, which is sort of a classic, um, you know, you have to diff that whole list but you only make one or two calls out to the DOM, right? So it's a lot of computational work to understand which very targeted changes you should make. Um, the WebAssembly frameworks do really well. You don't see that 5, 10, 15% slowdown. Um, in fact, you've got VanillaJS at 28, Sledgehammer at 28, Wasm BindGen at 29. These ones, um, as reference implementations, they're allowed to cheat. So they don't actually do the computation. They just swap the rows. Um, solids at like 30.5, Leptos down at 29, Dioxys 30.7, Sycamore 30.5, U 30.5. So in other words, in these cases where you're doing most of the computation in WebAssembly and then just one or two calls out to the DOM, um, the Rust WASM frameworks are as fast as solid. Even U, right, which overall is quite a bit slower, even U is exactly as fast as solid on this benchmark. Um, and Leptos is the fastest. Um, likewise with clearing the rows, right? Solid is at 38, Leptos is 34, Dioxys 38, Sycamore 40, U is quite a bit slower on this one, fair enough. But on these, on these benchmarks where um, you're doing most of the work inside WebAssembly, right, to make small changes to the DOM, um, 
the Rust WASM frameworks are actually doing a great job. Um, it's just those things, particularly creation, right, where you have to um, generate a whole bunch of strings and ship them into the DOM, right, where you see the, the real cost. Um, You'll notice, right, the way this works is you have a bunch of strings, you create a thousand rows with random combinations of them, and they're maybe 20 or 30 characters long. So the way that um, string interop works is the real cost of WebAssembly here. Um, JavaScript, for reasons that I don't understand, but maybe due to the fact that it originates in the 90s, uses UTF-16 as its default string encoding. Rust, like most other languages, uses UTF-8. This means that Rust strings in uh, WebAssembly are UTF-8 encoded strings, but to pass them through to JavaScript, they have to be actually not only byte-wise copied from WebAssembly into JavaScript, but then re-encoded from UTF-8 into UTF-16. We think about creating a thousand rows here, right? And each of these are maybe, I don't know, 20 characters. Um, that's 20 kilobytes of strings you have to do. And the way that the benchmark works, it goes create, clear, create, clear, create, clear, create, clear, do, 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 right? And over and over, it's pass, it's copying all this data, re-encoding it, doing it back, which is just an added overhead for all of these, um, all of these Rust WebAssembly libraries. Except that Sledgehammer is this custom renderer that Dioxys created. Amazing work on this, right? Which has a lot of optimizations around the cost of passing strings um, from WebAssembly over into JavaScript. A lot of optimizations around the cost of creating elements, so they actually have their own special. Um, encoding that doesn't pass element names as strings, right? They do everything they can to speed up that um, that cost of passing stuff when you're creating it from uh, WebAssembly over into JavaScript, and that's where they get these amazing amazing results that are um, almost on par in terms of you know creating elements, almost on par with something like vanilla JavaScript, almost on par with Solid. They're really cutting down a lot of the cost of doing that creation. Um, but then what about these differences between the uh, the Rust frameworks, right? Because we all, you know, we know and love Rust, uh, right? Um, so what if you're choosing between these frameworks? Um, I'm going to dig in a, mostly to you, Dioxys, and Leptos in this example. Sycamore and Leptos are working in very similar ways. Um, the main difference is that Leptos is using um, template node cloning to create the elements. So you'll see kind of small improvements in the creation speed, particularly when you have a lot of rows, right? This 603 to the Leptos 511. Um, that's the, the main difference here. If you look, the other benchmarks are pretty similar. The Selectro one is also different. This is just a, a different primitive that Leptos is using to drive a particular fine-grained reactive change when you do this, and it highlights each one of those in red. Um, Leptos is using an approach that really only triggers the two that are changing and doesn't even check anything for the other thousand of them. Um, but other than that, Leptos and Sycamore, very, very similar performance, very similar approaches. Um, the differences between U, Dioxys, and Leptos, or U, Dioxys, and Sycamore are much bigger. So if you're interested in Sycamore, just replace Leptos and what I'm about to say in your head with Sycamore, and it'll mostly all be true. Um, so let's look at look at some code here. I'm going to start with U. Um, you know, the first thing you'll notice um, is that this is divided up into two different components. So you've got this, um, it's actually three components, I guess. You've got this Jumbotron. You've got this um, sort of app component. The Jumbotron, of course, is um, just the one that has all the buttons in it. Um, they've got an app component that manages all the rows, right? And then they've got a row component. So this is the first important thing to know about virtual DOM frameworks. Um, what happens when you make a change in a virtual DOM framework like this um, is that it, it reruns the component, it re-renders the component, it creates a tree of virtual DOM nodes, and then it diffs that against the last set of virtual DOM nodes. So when you're thinking about performance for VDOM frameworks, um, the smaller the component is, the less diffing you have to do for a particular update. So components have a lot of meaning, particularly with regard to performance, because you want to make basically your component as small as you can um, to encapsulate the meaning of something while also not rerunning the whole thing. So in other words, when I just do a partial update, when I just add the exclamation points, I don't want to create a new virtual DOM for the Jumbotron, right? So you split out the row from the Jumbotron so that when the row, the label changes, you add those exclamation points, um, only this row component reruns. Uh, and this is the same for you, for Dioxys, both virtual DOM frameworks, right? Um, 
But so what is what what actually happens when I press that button to add those exclamation points? What happens is that this um, you know you sends a message, updates its model, reruns this view function, and this view function actually generates a new tree, and then it diffs it against the last tree, like I said. Um, now here's the problem. This is why VDOM frameworks have traditionally been slower than um, than more fine grained reactive frameworks like Leptose, like Sycamore, like Solid. Um, when you diff those two trees, the framework will literally say, okay, um, I've got a TR here, I've got a table row. Does the old one have a table row? Yes, good, okay. Um, I've got the class, it's, it's danger. Is the old one danger? You know, oh no, the old one was, was nothing. Let's add the danger thing, right? This is if you're doing the select row, I guess. Um, no, the old one wasn't danger. The new one isn't danger, great. Um, let's see. We've got a TD here, right? Do you have a TD? Yeah, I've got a TD. Okay, we got a class, it's call medium one. Is yours call medium one? Yeah. Okay, um, props.data.id is zero. Is yours zero? Yeah, mine's zero too, right? It literally goes through every node. And this isn't that slow, right? It's basically a bunch of partial equal checks, um, but it's not fast, right? It's a bunch of work that you do over and over and over again. And if you're doing that exclamation point, that partial update, right, we know as the users, as the people watching this, that the only node that's actually gonna change during that is this one, this label, right? Context.props.label. So the only thing in this entire tree that's going to change um, is that one node, but you still have to go through and diff the entire thing because uh, the framework doesn't know that, right? It's just uh, creating all of that. So that's part of why you and React, which take almost the same approach, um, are on the slower end, right? Because they're doing a lot of additional work on every one of those updates um, that honestly we know at compile time you don't need to do. This is part of the insight of um, what has made Dioxys so fast in its new 0.3 release, right? Really great work. Um, they've basically taken the insight that actually you know at compile time, right? We have a compiled language. You know what in that row is gonna change. So this looks very similar. I mean, they have a different syntax for their view macro, right? Um, but if you think about it, right, when you're compiling a macro like this, you see, okay, that's a TR. This can literally never be anything different from a TR. That's just the element name. It's never going to change. Um, however, this class, that's a dynamic thing. That's a variable. That can change. Um, this TD can't change. This class also can't change, right? This is a string literal, right? The value of call medium one can never change. Um, oh, but here's label.key, that's a format string, so this can change. So what Dioxys actually does is it goes through and um, instead of just compiling into a kind of naive virtual DOM node like U, right, U is going to represent this internally as a, a struct with an element string and some attributes in a vector and some children in a vector. Um, Dioxys will actually distinguish between the static parts and the dynamic parts of the template. Um, which means that when Dioxys does a partial update, right, um, Dioxys doesn't check to see if this TR is still a TR, doesn't check if this TD is still a TD, doesn't check if this class is still call medium one, because it knows it can't change. It checks a few things. It checks whether is in danger is still the same. It will check label.key, I guess. It will check maybe label.label. Um, that's it. It's only diffing like three things, right? When you when you rerun this component, it does the same thing where it re-renders the component and reruns. But because it distinguishes between static and dynamic parts, right? Um, the diffing is those three really fine-grained nodes. Super smart approach, pioneered by a, a kind of experimental JavaScript library called BlockDom, I think. But it's very similar to the kind of fine-grained reactive approach, even though it's actually not that. Um, so. This is why Dioxys is so fast on updates. If you look um, in terms of the partial update results, right? Um, again, I, I think this is a particularly good run for them. Like the fact that this is the same as vanilla JS suggests that um, there's some statistical noise in this always, right? Um, but you know, that's quite fast, right? As uh, uh, compared to use virtual DOM, right? Which is about 10 points slower than Sycamore than Leptos. Um, so you can see the advantages there, but you also get big advantages in terms of the creation speed, right? Because they can do this analysis, right? And then they know, 
well, we're always going to ship the, the static parts. And so we can just store that once in JavaScript and then clone it over and over again, and then just update these dynamic parts. Um, and along with Sledgehammer, that's a big part of what gets them there on the creation speed. Um, we do a very similar thing where you create an HTML template element that's like literally a template string, um, clone that template element, uh, clone its contents to create a bunch of um, elements and then fill in just the dynamic parts. Um, and it's really cool that with a virtual DOM library, you can still do that, um, even though in theory it has these virtual DOM nodes you're doing diffing and stuff. Um, but it's because they're using the compiler, the, taking advantage of the fact that Rust is already a compiled language, um, to do that diffing. Um, and then something like Leptos or Sycamore, right? Um, you'll notice one big difference here is, right, we just have it all in one component um, because components never rerun um, in, this, in this framework, right? When I make a change to the label, it doesn't uh, re-render my whole jumbotron here, right? Um, there's this stuff never, ever, ever changes. It's just some buttons with event listeners, um, but it's not reactive at all. This never changes. This never changes. It's only this for loop, right? Which is just a keyed, um, keyed list implementation. Um, so we have the keys, which are the row IDs, uh, and then we do, you know, some diffing when those things move around. We need to know: Do I need to move this row or not? Do I need to remove this row? Um, and then each of the rows is just rendered. It's a, it's a template. Um, it gets cloned. And again, very similar to the Dioxys approach here, right? We know this TR is always a TR. It never changes. We know the TD is always a TD. We know the class is always the same, right? These things just don't change. So we don't need to think about them at all. The difference between something like Leptos and something like Dioxys is that when label changes here, whoops, when, um, when label changes here, right? When we press that button to add those exclamation points, what Dioxys is going to do, right, is that Dioxys is going to re-render this, diff those three points, um, and then update one of them, which is the text node. Um, Leptos is just going to rerun this little block here, right, um, from here to here. And it's just going to update that text node over and over and over. Likewise, with this, this class danger, when this selector changes, right, when we select a new row, it just finds the exact rows that have flipped from selected as true to selected as false, or selected as false to selected as true, and toggles the class on those. So we can do these much more fine-grained updates. You can still get really good performance with an approach like Dioxys in a scenario like this where there are only uh, three, three small nodes that you're diffing, um, but it's not that true fine-grained reactivity in a sense, right? Those things do have to be diffed. Um, but still, fantastic performance. Um, all around, you know. I want to look at two other things in this benchmark, which are really important, though, when we talk about performance, because the other disadvantage of WebAssembly is that WebAssembly binary sizes are large. They're larger than JavaScript, and you also have to ship JavaScript, right? So, like, the amount of JavaScript that's required to kind of bootstrap and do the glue code for a Leptos app is almost as much JavaScript as you need for a solid app, but then we're also shipping all the WebAssembly, right? Um, so I want to look at the startup metrics, um, which are from, you know, Lighthouse, Lighthouse mobile metrics, um, and look at what the cost of WebAssembly really is in loading. Now, granted, this is a very small and simple application, right? Your real app, you're going to be shipping a much larger bundle than this. And one of the main issues right now is that we don't have WebAssembly code splitting that really works. So unlike JavaScript, where you can split your bundle into a bunch of pieces, um, WebAssembly, you're shipping one big chunk. Um, however, if you look at this, um, so if you look at this total kilobyte weight, right, you can really see the differences here. Um, you know, vanilla JS shipping 150k, Wasm Vine Gen is 185, Sycamore 279, Leptos is bigger, U is bigger, Dioxys is quite big. Let me add, um, just like for reference, maybe Svelte and Solid back in. So here's Solid, here's Svelte, right? Um, and let's give React to. React hooks, there we go. So in terms of bundle sizes, right, you immediately see that all of the JavaScript, this, this vanilla JS is unminified, by the way. Um, so that's why it's a little bigger than, than these guys. But Svelte, solid, vanilla JS, all smaller. React is actually big enough that it's, it's bigger than something like Sycamore, which is funny. It's shipping enough JavaScript uh, that it's larger than Sycamore's WebAssembly. Um, but you know, you'll notice there's a disconnect here between the kilobyte weight, how much you're actually shipping, um, and consistently interactive. 
And I should say also that all of these um, WebAssembly examples, these are compiled with opt level equals three, right, for, for speed, the highest speed you can uh, in Cargo, rather than opt level equals Z, the smallest size you can. And none of this is gzipped, none of this is minified at all, right, in the, in the Rust ones. So these numbers are a little bigger than they would be. But let's organize it a different way, right, by consistently interactive. So this is time to interactive when the, the page loads. Um, You'll notice two things. One is that React is the slowest, um, Dioxys. Um, the other thing you'll notice is these numbers are all basically the same. 1877, 1877, 6, 1877, 77, 77, 7, 78, 1, 78, 4. What does this suggest? What this suggests is that there's a floor in this benchmark. We're using, um, what, Bootstrap? <laughs> There's a certain amount of stuff like CSS that has to load before we can render anything on the page at all. And so there's a floor to, to how, um, how quickly, you know, how much the JavaScript and the WebAssembly actually affect it. And what you're seeing here is that Leptos, Sycamore, Wasm Bindgen, they're all coming, you, right? They're all coming in underneath that floor. So for a small application like this, right? What's blocking the loading time is not actually JavaScript or WebAssembly, it's actually the CSS. Um, so I think that's pretty interesting. In a larger application, right, it's a very different story because WebAssembly just scales linearly, where JavaScript would do some bundle splitting and so on. Um, but again, the speed of WebAssembly streaming compilation is such that even four or five years ago, Firefox was saying, look, we can basically compile this at the speed it can come in over the network. Um, so the cost of 500 kilobytes of WebAssembly, um, or you know, say it's a, it's a megabyte, maybe it gzips to 400 kilobytes, it's not exactly the cost of just downloading 400 kilobytes, but it's pretty close, right? So you have to think if you're in something um, in a resource constrained environment, um, or you are in, a, in an industry like e-commerce where, I mean, milliseconds are dollars, right? Maybe it's not time for WebAssembly yet. But if you're building an application um, where people can um, wait, I don't know, uh, you know, a tenth of a second, a quarter of a second for something to load, you know, maybe that's different. And then remember that once one WASM bundle has loaded, that's your entire application. So there are no subsequent fetches for more stuff. And it's all just compiling streaming as it's coming in. Um, the other thing I want to look at if you're looking at this benchmark yourself and you're curious is just the, the memory allocation results here. Um, you'll notice there are huge differences between the, the JavaScript and the WebAssembly ones. That's because basically um, the way that it's measured uh, WebAssembly sort of claims pages of memory, you can almost think of it, big chunks of memory um, from the browser. And then, you know, the, the, the metrics here aren't necessarily introspecting that to see sort of, okay, what's actually being used? So that whereas the JavaScript stuff is, is garbage collected. So you'll see all of the WebAssembly ones are much higher. Um, but then within the WebAssembly ones, right, um, you'll notice that they're all pretty close. They all have this sort of stable 1.8, 1.9 um, megabytes of memory that they get on first load. Um, and then you can see some some differences. So let's look at the, the run memory here. Um, you know, Leptos and Dioxys are pretty memory efficient. You and Sycamore are a little bit less so. Um, there's probably some kind of weird leak happening here in, in Leptos when we're creating and clearing a bunch of stuff. I think I maybe delay reclaiming some of that memory or whatever. Um, but in terms of the updates, right, you're, you're running at a pretty steady pace. In terms of, um, you know, creating 10,000 rows, right, uh, what's actually kind of funny here is that the, the React memory usage looks a lot like the WebAssembly memory usage, even though the other JavaScript libraries have a totally different profile, right? So React is really using a lot of memory here. Um, but you'll notice, you know, Leptos and Dioxys are both just using a, a lot less memory than something like you, for example. And I think it is because of that different approach that's not doing as much work on, on every run. Um, so, yeah, I mean, what's the truth about uh, Rust and WebAssembly performance? Um, what can I say? You know, if if faster rendering than Svelte and an equivalent load time for a small app doesn't convince you that um, WebAssembly is ready, ready for use, then I don't know what can. Um, but, you know, I hope that you enjoyed this video. I hope you got a little bit out of it as far as um, what the actual performance constraints are on WebAssembly. People come to me all the time and ask, you know, I want to start an e-commerce site. Should I use Leptos? And it's like, no, probably not. Like, you got to really think about what are the performance constraints in your environment. Um, but for a lot of applications, you know, the kind of rendering speeds we're talking about here, that difference between solid at 1.08, 1.09, and a Leptos or a Dioxys at 1.14, that's something that you will never, ever, ever notice in actual use of your application. 
if you're creating a thousand rows in a table, you're going to virtualize that table. You know, like this stuff is about pushing things to the extremes. Um, but what that shows is that basically WebAssembly is ready for prime time. So I hope you have a great day and I hope you're building great applications. Take care.